So Gordon doesn't look like um, <laughs> just miss the beat shot. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandy Mandich. I know most of you, uh, and it's great to see so many of the beat team members here. And I want to thank especially to Janet again for providing this opportunity to share with you uh, 10 plus years of a beat research journey from pilot project to an award-winning research program. And actually, I'm not gonna share any of the findings today. I'll just be telling you more about the project management side of it and the behind the scenes things. Um, I'm originally from Croatia. I did my undergraduate degree in Serbia, moved to Canada, did my post, uh, did my master's and PhD degree at University of Alberta, pro seven years. Canada and all I wanted to do was to go south. I uh, moved to California, did a postdoc at Stanford, and uh, then was attracted to a job on the other side of the globe from Croatia and came to New Zealand to the meeting at the end of 2020 to, to 2008 to join the University of Otago. Uh, here at Otago, I started the BEATS research program, which stands for Built Environment and Active Transport to School, and that's what you're going to hear about today. And uh, this program and the research team won the Otago Research Group Award in 2019 for this work. I moved to Auckland University of Technology at the, in early 2021 and uh, established my own consultancy, agile research. I joined the Project Management Institute and moved in the project management sector as well. Uh, I work for Wellington City Council full time for over two years now in the transport sector, and I've been busy writing some books on our research project management as part of Compostite Research Training Resources. So it's been a journey of a nine country, nine cities, five countries, three continents, few languages, and many colleagues and friends around the globe. So I'll take you on a part of that journey today. So I have just based on what I mentioned that I will tell you a little bit about the books in a moment. Uh, but I, I am founder and director of the research consultancy Agile Research. As I say, I currently am still adjunct professor at AUT, Open University of Technology, founder and principal investigator of BEATS. I'm research affiliate of the Center for Sustainability here at, at Otago. Um, have a project management certification and work as a team leader transport strategy program for City Council. By the way, all at the same time. <laughs> so it's been a super busy time. But what we're going to talk about today is this BEAT research program. So this was an interdisciplinary and cross-sector research program that was founded as a partnership between academia, schools, local city council, and the wider community. And uh, it was looking at how adolescents travel to school. So I'm going to unpack this whole infographics as we go through the, through the slides. But I cannot start any of these presentations without thanking a number of people who contributed to this work over 10 plus years. And it's actually a real pleasure to see six of them in the audience. So there is actually, it's, it's really fantastic. And out of those six in the audience, plus me as eight, 14 members have been there from day one till the last day. So the program closed about five months ago officially, although we still continue publishing stuff. But I want to thank you also. Can I have Gordon, Charlotte, and Janet please stand up? And thank you so much for all your support for the last 10 plus years. If you want to say anything, Gordon, you're welcome. I mean, anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So it's been, and Maggie as well is here, and uh, Kim, they've been a part of this for the last couple of years. So many, many people. So the purpose of this program was to examine uh, our wide range of factors, how adolescents travel from home to school, uh, and uh, basically looking at individual, social, environmental, and policy factors. Uh, we have, uh, in New Zealand, the transport is really dominated by private vehicle, vehicles. So in Auckland, for example, 80% of household trips are made by private vehicle. Uh, Wellington and Dunedin have the highest rates of walking to work at 9%. Some European cities would not be impressed with that, but it's pretty good for New Zealand. Um, highest rates of public transport user in Wellington for travel to work, 18%. And highest rates of cycling to work is in Taishuj at 7%. So, and also what we've seen over the last couple of decades, in New Zealand, the only thing that has grown over time is a car use, so traveling by car either as a driver or as a passenger, while all other modes have been declining. 
And similarly, when we look at how adolescents travel to school, uh, this is the data for New Zealand uh, high school students from late 88, uh, 1980s, early 1990s, all the way to about 2014. We can see that uh, car usage has increased from about 21% to about 30% in, in more recent years. Walking remains stable at about 25%, and cycling dropped from 19% to basically 3% for adolescents in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So the BEAT research was established by academics to begin with, and it was me looking at what was going on and thinking, I was really interested in physical activity. My background is exercise science, so I was looking at it from a physical activity and health perspective, understanding that we have very low rates of physical activity, uh, sufficient physical activity among adolescents. Only eight out of, well, only two out of 10 meet the minimum physical activity guideline, and that's paid and self-report, which we know how that works. Um, and active transport is one of those means that can facilitate that can increase or help maintain higher levels of physical activity. Uh, we know from research as well that there was a range of individual, family, social, environmental, and policy factors that influence how people travel from a place to a place, and in this case, how adolescents travel to school. And that if we're doing research, we need to examine those multiple levels of influence on the travel behaviors, and that requires an interdisciplinary approach and a cross sectoral approach. So in addition to knowledge of the literature, there were some specific uh, aspects of the context of the need and why this was initiated in the needed. So at the time, the needed city council uh, identified the need to improve safety of walking and cycling around a uh, cluster of schools that are located in the city center. And uh, we designed the city original initial study to collect comprehensive baseline data for a future evaluation of the infrastructure changes that were anticipated in the funding was received for uh, making the cycle lanes throughout the main city. So that's how the beats started. Uh, I think I will share this presentation with you some interesting facts because when you look at something that's successful, you may think, gosh, you know, this was an easy ride. You just got the funding, you moved on. We started with $5,000 in 2013 with internal grant for a little pilot project, which was very overly ambitious, but I didn't know about project management at that time, and I just wanted to get money to get something going. Um, and we designed the study looking at that uh, ecological model for active transport where what individual does depends on the individual itself, but also those decisions of traveling to school are influenced by wider social and cultural environment, built environment, and policy environment. So when we put all this together, um, we designed a study that actually collected data on each of these levels of the ecological model for active transport to school. And without going into the details, this is how it looked like behind the scenes. So here you have each level of the ecological model. This was saying what we're going to do at each level. This is the specific outcome measures, what kind of things we're going to measure, and this is how we're going to do it. So that was May 2013, and we had $5,000. Thanks. So it was a, quite an interesting one. So this was the methodology that was imagined. I brought a few people on board at the, for initial discussions, including Janet and Gordon. Um, we, wanted, we wanted to do an online survey of adolescents and parents, measure the height and weight of adolescents. We wanted to uh, give them uh, physical activity meters to measure how much physical activity they actually do, not what they say, but what they actually do. Um, we wanted to see how heavy the school bags are. We wanted them to map the route from home to school and tell us which areas are unsafe and why, so we can potentially do something about it. Uh, we wanted to analyze those data of built environment using GIS. But now we wanted also to supplement the quantitative research with qualitative research. So there was an idea of we'll run some focus groups, interview school principals. Um, so that was the idea, right? So I remember being in staff class with Janet, uh, Debbie Hopkins, who is now at Oxford. Uh, Gordon, you weren't on that meeting, you were the one that followed about a week later. And I started drawing all this on a piece of paper. There was a couple of other academics with Jan Gordon board and just said, just to see what, what I'm planning so we can see who wants to be involved. And they just looked at me kind of like, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. But, but how about we start? So basically, what had, this was what the Beats was envision, envisioning to do. So how adolescents travel to school from different areas which mode of, of transport they choose to get to school. And these are all those different measures that I showed you on the previous side, slide, what we wanted to do. Well, that was all great, but how do you pull it off and who's going to pay for it? 
So this was the question in May 2013. So I started with pulling the people out, pulling the people together who I thought may be interested in this work and see having a conversation with some of the colleagues across other departments at the University of Otago, inviting a couple of my colleagues from overseas and actually looking at people from different disciplines. And then Charlotte, who is here in the audience, she was working as a safe and sustainable transport coordinator in the Lincoln City Council. And she was very interested in this piece of work and some specific things that the Lincoln City Council wanted to know. So we all got together, we started kind of putting the whole thing together, but um, so initially there was a couple of departments involved with the University of Otago and several, the Lincoln City Council and several universities, but we didn't stop there. We actually extended this and went into the community. So we just said, well, it's, I was thinking as an investigator, I can't just go and tell schools what they're going to do. They understand much better the city council what they need. And uh, so the, Gordon Dawson, who is sitting here, and thank you, Gordon, being there from the literally our first week of discussions of beats 11 years ago almost now. Uh, he was a manager of the Nina Secondary Schools Partnership, and he joined the conversations and just trying to see what we've done and what are we doing and what are we planning to do and provide us some very useful guidance at a time from a school's perspective. Um, Andrew Loney worked at the Lincoln City Council. He provided also support and uh, for the program and feedback. Ruth Steiner, she worked for getting the lead, she was manager of getting the lead active initiative uh, at a time. So she joined on board. Janet, from the first conversation, said, I have a little bit too much on my plate, but here's my postdoc, Debbie Hopkins, who was uh, who can join the beats and do the qualitative side of, of research one day a week for over a year, or I think almost two years. So that was super helpful. And Janet said, well, I can be on advisory board and help you with a, providing some strategic advice about the program and then moving on. And then there was Tara Duncan at the time was a department of tourism and Susan Sandretto from College of Education, who also, also provided specific advice that we needed for our research team. So we put the, all these people together. I thought they don't really fit under the investigator's hat, but we wanted to do something for them acknowledge their role. So we called them advisory board. So there we got the all advisory board members. So now looking at these, so one of the really unique aspects of these, that it was really a partnership and collaboration between academia, school, city council, and the wider community. And when we put all these different aspects that we wanted to examine together and all these different people from different disciplines and sectors, the, the areas covered by these were exercise sciences, health, transport, built environment, and education. It was massive. So um, we started, uh, as I said, this is a summary again. Uh, the real core of this is not only the research questions, what we wanted to answer, but really that whole idea it had to be an interdisciplinary approach and it had to be a cross-sectoral approach for that to succeed. So one of the highlights of this is really community-based participatory approach. And this is where you bring the people from the community and bring basically the stakeholders and work with them on starting from what's the research question, what are we going to do about this, and how are we going to do it? So this was, and not only that, we actually involved the stakeholders to be a part of our, our community, to be a part of our team, make decisions together on how the program was evolving, and participate in preparation and publication of research outputs down the road. So it was quite a quite an interesting um well, and interesting, it was a unique and a wonderful opportunity to work together and learn from each other. And if any of you would like to say anything about that, I mean, can you just let me know. But then that was all great, wonderful, grandiose idea, big, hairy, audacious goals with absolutely no support to get it going. So I spent uh, uh, 13 months or 15 months writing about 15 different recent grant applications to try to get a little bits and pieces funded. So you can see here on the top, these are the funding that we actually got, the research funding we got, but there were some usually much larger research done that we didn't have, we didn't get. And I think for me, one of the key lessons from that is this is the first application I ever done for a health research council for a funding for the entire original piece that I showed you. And it came back with this evaluation, AOE, e -I -E -O -I stands for expression of interest. It's like a three-pager to tell them what you're gonna do. And then there were six different criteria, the research impact, the quality of the research team, the research methodology, importance of research, 
uh, I don't remember what else was there. Feasibility. This is the lowest screen tile on all of them. I I see this. I was a new academic five years ago. Like, I literally cried. And I said, but this is such a great project because they were telling us we can't do it for one point two million dollars. So it pulled it off on three hundred thousand over the next couple of months, a couple of years. But that was the grant application I received. I literally remember like it my soul was crushed. And I said, well, too bad you don't like it, we'll do it anyway. And that's what we did. So never don't worry about what the funding bodies say. Just if you have a vision, just go for it. Find it other ways. Somebody will <laughs> like it. <laughs> so basically, 15 months later, we had a small grant, much smaller amount of money, but we actually had grants that covered literally all aspects of what we wanted to do, to some extent, and that's how we proceeded. So now, I'll, I'll show you some of the slides without trying for you to understand all of it, but just to show you the story of how this evolved. So we started getting ready for data collection. There was so much to be prepared, just to go in schools and collect data from students, and then not to mention parents. That was simple. But to coordinate all that, the amount of preparation of uh, logistics, the research tools we had to develop, preparation for focus groups and interviews, recruitment of schools, students, parents, teachers, principals, rewards for all different levels, getting the staff on board and training them, establishing the collaborations and keeping the collaboration going. So when I looked at all that, I was like, wow, that was a good idea, Sandy. So I thought, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. So I went online and found a course, online course on project management. And I took this course, it was a single course of um, uh, a one month, and it was just a couple, it was one of those open to study courses. And I discovered so much stuff that was so cool that I've never ever seen as an academic. I thought, wow, I really need that. So Charlotte was at the time working at the main city council, and she was really into project management, she needed it for her work. And you were actually planning to do a PMP, project management professional certification. So we got together, Charlotte, me, and another um, uh, admin person from the department where I was located who was interested in that. And we organized a monthly session. We go and discuss different aspects of project management. And that was the time that I've actually learned so much about what can help me with structure to the madness. And that has changed my professional life in academia. And as you will see shortly, it's changed my professional life overall. So um, I would just say learn about project management and definitely learn about marketing, your research and everything else. So just show you some examples of a study material. So it's so much that you wanted to discuss with the school principals and tell them about the study, but they're busy people. And even if they want to support you, you need to do something that's simple for them. They can look at it, understand it's all they like it, they don't like it. We had Gordon who talked about lots of that guide us how do we go and work with schools. But this was a three size poster. And this is what we brought to the meetings, and this is what we went over with the school principals. Just that. There was plenty more we could give them, but that's as much as they could process and digest and say whether they liked the study or what they thought about. We also wanted to give a lot of materials to these schools, but then we realized very soon, like, if we start printing all this, and if we change it, then we need to reprint it. The thing is, so we actually, I put together the website. I managed this whole thing. I established the website. I put together a website myself. It was with... Uh, University of Chicago, anytime anybody could do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept that log in until I finished the Otago. But actually, we put this website together and uh, developed like information for different groups, whoever needs to know what. And then when you love that information for study participants, depending who they were, they could go on a particular page, the information was there, reduced the amount, massive amounts of printing, and just made things much more accessible. Time to work quietly, pull it off. This is my favorite thing. So we did that for I think it's a petition, and then you prepare an information sheet. And we showed up in the first school that was super keen to help us out, met with the school principal, and the school principal was very kind. She was an absolutely lovely woman. And um, she looked at me and smiled and said, threw the paper behind the back and said, nobody's going to take part. She said, well, <laughs> she said, well nobody's going to read this. They're 13, 15, 16 years old. They don't read it. This is boring. She said, Oh, oh, okay. So we went back and spent months. We didn't have any money to pay for a graphic design and all that stuff. Revising the, the, the consent form to be in this form. Then it was a pamphlet that was folded three times. 
you come back to the ethics, ethics is horrified. <laughs> I'm not going to read this. Like, but this is nothing but our information. So you know, please read it. It has all the information that you require. It was quite an effort to get that in the ethics. I mean, they never tried, they realized that, but it was literally uh, a massive change. And so that worked until we figured out that folding pamphlets. And you know, spent first of all, we figured out printing the color is very expensive, even though it looked very nice on that slide. We ended up using just a colored paper and printing black and white. And then we had a parties of folding pamphlets for hours. <laughs> and we would go out visit the school and they said, We want you to approach 800 students, which means they need to get 800 talks of study information, including 800 of these, right? And then the students leave, and there is half of them are turned into airplanes or scratching the balls. And stuff. I've learned my lesson, never ever folding pamphlets for, <laughs> for the researchers. Um, so we went and designed the surveys. It took us one year as a team of 10 investigators and people from, our, from other community to put together the survey for students. That we were all happy with and shaped and there was about 30 for them in the survey, which is considerable. And then we put together a parental survey, and, you know, as an as academic, so, oh, we need to ask them this, and we need to ask them that. And I was so excited because there was no research on parents or adolescents. Well, I didn't realize why. Three years later, I knew why. <laughs> there was nothing published in parents or adolescents. So we designed this survey, and it was, it was asking so many different things. Nobody wants to take part. So we went back and revised the survey. We cut it down to 15, 20 minutes. Still, nobody wants to say five. So we spent three years, and the most amount of money we spent on beats one, most amount of time and money was put into it. And that was the most painful part of the process, and I would never do that as a researcher. And I'm happy to acknowledge that it's not in that part there, and probably will stay that way. <laughs> I'm not resolving that knowledge gap yet, <laughs> or trying to. So we had this glamorous idea how it's going to all work out in one day, and we put out the pilot project in 2013. Four schools were very keen to collect some initial data. The first school said, great, we'll give you 73 students in, or 75 students in one hour. <laughs> first session, three different classrooms, computer labs. We went with eight people. We had one hour, three computer laboratories. There was over 60 participants. It was 70 something. And there was eight research staff. And during that one hour, we were asking the lessons to complete 30 to 40 minute online survey, which at the time we imagined they would just go in and do the survey, right? Um, we would measure the height and weight. Uh, we would be organized here. These activity meters that we were designed, if they said they wanted one, we were setting them up on a spot to give them by the end of the hour and give them the marks to mark their read. Guess how that went? <laughs> we revised our research procedures completely after that session. It's like, I was a little bit on that list, right? Um, so anyway, so we revised the procedures and we were ready for the full survey. And so the following year, we rolled out the survey to all the new schools and we got 100% school recruitment rate. This is absolutely unheard of in research, in any type of research. And it's not because of the brilliance of academic research topic, of the importance of academic research topic, of the knowledge gap. It was because of having a champion and that was Gordon Wilson, who is here with us today, who was the manager of the Lean Secondary School Partnerships and who actually wanted to support this research and made it as a win win. Everybody was getting something out of the research, including the schools. And actually, it was through Gordon and through the partnerships that we got to all schools. So, thank you again, Gordon. Absolutely amazing. And I know the reviewers are still, our, our reviewers of our papers are always still asking, Do you have a representative sample? I said, I'm going to have a percent of students. They have them. That's pretty good. <laughs> Sandy, I'll add just one thing. Yes. You and your other researchers uh, allowed us to put the whole school choice stuff in. We were interested in something other than transport. To be honest, transport wasn't the issue with us, but school choice was. Mm -hmm. So we said to Sandy, if you can include questions on school, school choice, we'll, all of us will be in. I hadn't told them some of the schools that they'll be in, but they all were in. Because that gave us the information that we required for our communities that particular time. So that's why it was a win-win. Yeah, and I think that's actually my next slide, or maybe next slide, but it's coming. And it's just showing you the entire project was set up as win-win, and it was run as win-win. That all the organizations, the Lean City Council and Charlton and all, posed specific questions about bike library, about cycle skills training for adolescents, and we included that in a survey. So they were on board to support the survey because they were getting data that provided to them. Schools, as Gordon said, they were getting data on school choice. We not only collected the data, we offered that we're going to analyze the data and give them the report with the findings. 
because it's just it's something that's our capacity and capability we can do that and that's what we've been doing so as i said or it was really a win win and there will be a slide about that can anybody tell me time because i don't see it i can go forever 27 minutes oh uh, okay yeah that's okay so um about the oh i'll go back so planning the study implementation, again, I learned so much through studying the basics of project management and just came across, I'm not a native English speaker, as you probably figured out by now. I came across a magic abbreviation KPI. I heard of it, but I didn't have a clue what it stands for. I said, oh, key performance indicator, that sounds rather important. So I've actually integrated a lot of those learnings into the beats behind the scenes, what nobody actually has seen. And one of the things was designing these um, uh, work breakdown structures, which actually broke down our, this is the work overview of a school's participation. It was actually in a beats project, in a, in a beats, uh, in the original beats study. There were so many things we needed to do with every single school just to complete the data collection of that school. And it was having that structure, knowing that there are tools like that was super, super helpful. And so this was our lab at the time, managing data collection. We had a three different terms in 2014. It was an absolute madness. Each school had two of these. One was the work breakdown structure for participation in the overall study. And the other one was for student survey on data collection. It was, it was mad, but one. Um, we also designed the study procedures, we described them and uh, refined them over time. This is the folding pamphlets party that I mentioned. So this is a number of pamphlets. We, we would bring the cookies and the muffins and, and then students would be there for hours for including some music on and folding pamphlets. Um, then we went into schools. Uh, each school was their own experience with data collection, like a just unique experience. So we did a lot of training of the staff in the background, research assistants, students, volunteers. I, when I learned about KPI, I said, oh, well, we should monitor the budget and see how we go. So this is actually monitoring of the budget uh, of the funding spent on the project in the blue and green being the student survey, because that was our main thing, how many students we surveyed. Budget was never there for data analysis. That always comes afterwards. I mean, at least for a small project funds. And you can see that in a year and a half, we actually accomplished 178% um, of student survey what we said we would do, and we spent about three quarters of the budget. We still spend the rest of the budget on processing data, et cetera, but that was actually an amazing achievement. And we tracked this on a monthly basis. Um, and there was a lot of things that were happening in the background that I and the team have done to keep the team together and keep learning, quit learning from each other. And, um, and I said, celebrating milestones along the way and take lots of photos. We have thousands of photos from this team. Um, everybody's thinking about that right now, including the photo we took today. <laughs> Marty, you missed that. We can do another one afterwards. So, what I walked you through basically, I've just in half an hour, 25 minutes, I've basically walked you through five years of this. And just to show you how long it took from the vision and design to establishing collaboration, writing grants, planning the research procedures, recruiting the schools, doing the data collection, till we got to the chance to start analyzing data. And the first reports and publications were actually about three years after we initiated the idea. So that was really helpful when we talk about the time on how it, it takes time and research always takes longer than planned. Um, one, one important thing is always working with a stakeholder, especially if you're working with people from outside academia, you need to communicate progress. So what we did, I started writing these progress reports. They were very basic. You can see they have evolved significantly over a four-year period. Um, but I was just doing that every year or every two years. And I've actually just released the latest and final week's report, which you can have a look at, and it's a 20-page infographic report that shows a, a project management side of a story as well as the overview of the publications. So we, we kept doing that since. Now, after we did a big study originally uh, and established the team, we actually embarked on a new challenge and went to the rural Otago and did a big rural study. So this is where we surveyed adolescents from 11 schools. If there was 15 days of data collection. Every school visit was a completely unique experience with many surprises on the spot. 
We had 17 research staff involved in it and uh, 750 hours of research person hours in schools. So that doesn't mean everything else, preparation and processing of the data. We've driven more than twice the length of New Zealand. That's actually, that's actually really shocking for collecting data in the closest, like we literally went to the closest school to the city, um, to the city where we were based, literally driving more than twice the length of New Zealand. There was lots of hours of unpaid travel time. We just couldn't pay for it. We told people, if you're gonna take part, that's great, but your drive to Monaco for three hours is just not gonna be paid. Um, thousands of emails and phone calls, anybody who coordinated projects knows about that, and spectacular New Zealand scenery, and many, many unforgettable memories. I don't have a written permission to share some of the photos. So I, I lost I lost touch with some of those people. So you will watch just like one of in this case. But what I did, I also in the background tracked the expenses, and it was really fascinating to see how much it costed us just to collect the data. It was seventy five dollars per student on average. In some schools, it was as high as hundred twelve dollars per student. Say. Right, so this is actually really good to inform when we're doing future grant applications. If you do that for your research grants, you will have a much better idea what potentially, um, what funding you require to complete data collection like that. So when we finished, by the time we finished that data collection, that was the first five years of our program. We basically surveyed over 200, uh, 2,600 adolescents and engaged 23 schools out of 27 in the entire tribal region. So then we expanded the vision on a team. We did a bit cultural study, a small, small study, just to see how we can look at Mar and Pacific adolescents and their perceptions of active transport, and then started with a bit natural experiment. So this is actually the original bit study when we designed it in 2014, 20, well, 2013, 2014. We knew that the city was planning to, in, uh, uh, to, to build some cycleways throughout the city. And they thought it would be a really good idea to collect a really comprehensive baseline data at that time about a lesson travel to, to school. And then we, we knew that there would be approximately exposure schools that would be about six of them that would have some cycling and pedestrian infrastructure changes and another six that wouldn't. And we thought we can have a natural experiment by collecting the follow-up data a couple of years later and see what changes are. So that was what the BITS 2 or BITS natural experiment was about. Well, that was all great. We had a wonderful multidisciplinary team. We always were open to welcome and find ways to keep great people on the team. Um, but the team, not but, the team evolved over time. So this is another thing. When you look at something successful, we say, oh gosh, they started like this. No, there was a lot of different, this is investigators. You can see some of them have moved to different roles. We had a lot of, um, a lot of change in the advisory board members. And that's usually quite a few of them were from the main city council. When one person resigned or moved on, then another person was assigned and they would be with our team for a shorter period of time. And we had a, a growing number of collaborators over the following three years. But what's really interesting here, there were five team members, so two investigators and three advisory board members that were actually there from day one to the our last day. And Charlotte, Gordon, and Janet are here with us today. Too. So thank you all. Without you, that wouldn't have succeeded. So this is the team in the last two years, um, which I'm so grateful they, they're the ones that carried the Beats 2 study through. There was over 10 years, there was actually 11 BITS investigators engaged, eight collaborators, 14 advisory board members, 25 research staff, 22 students, and 20 volunteers. It took quite a few hours to get these data out of my records <laughs> of the last 10 years, but it's really fascinating. And I just want to show you, those people are coming from five different continents and uh, 15 countries, 30, 11 scientific disciplines, and four different sectors. So you can see a little bit, there, there is more, again, people who I don't have permission to use photos, they're not on here, but there's actually many more people involved. And this is just a few pictures of these two in action. We had lots of fun in data collection schools. And one thing that people don't know over the 10 year period, I actually was present uh, for 90% of data collection in our schools. I was just there all the time. That was the best part of the entire research process. So thank you all. We attracted a lot of people to New Zealand. So over time, there was a dozen or 10 visitors from different countries that came to work with us because of these. And the beats actually inspired a couple of other projects in different parts of the world, just our work. 
that I know. Um, so we published 40 scientific articles from this work so far. There's about half a dozen in review at the moment still, and we're pretty much winding down from there. Uh, number of conference abstracts, and what I'm gonna show you at the end of this uh, presentation, actually our research productivity with the number of published conference abstracts and scientific articles per 1 million of research funding over 10 years is 10 times higher than the New Zealand average. Not one, not two times, not three, 10 times higher, which is beyond fantastic. So thank you all. And this is a little bit of fun that I had over this summer, trying to find out a little bit more facts about this. So we published our work in 19 different scientific journals. Uh, there were overall 55 co-authors of our work, uh, over 700 citations to date. Uh, the work was presented at 25 international and 20 national conferences, and we wrote a lot of technical reports, and I actually ended them up over 2,000 pages of technical reports for stakeholders. So, well done, Jane. Um, the, the, there is an overview of published big scientific articles that's actually a part of the report, which I, which I just passed around, and that's on our new BEATS uh, program webpage. So, if you go there, the report is really available to download, and you can, you can have a look. So um, how are we doing with time? Where am I at? So if I go for another 10 minutes and then we have questions, is that okay? Yeah. Uh, we had a, a different spin-off projects. I'm just gonna show you here more about like just seeing what else has been happening. We organized six different symposia to share the findings with the community. Um, we organized two international symposia here at, uh, at Otago, the Active Living Environment Symposia, and one of those symposia resulted in uh, forming the work group that actually developed policy recommendations for increasing active transport in New Zealand, and it was a cross-sectoral work. Uh, we disseminated findings widely beyond academia. So there has been a lot of dissemination for Ministry of Health, Ministry of uh, Transport, uh, the obviously the Ministry Council, the schools here in the Otago region, but other sectors as well, as well as cross-sectoral work. And we did a lot of, uh, there was about 54 media reports of which are shared, which share the findings with the general public. Uh, so for those of you who are into project management, just want to show you behind the scenes, we actually tracked the research outputs, how we were doing and which papers we were writing and how are they moving to the publication process. Um, I developed the whole BITS research outputs database, which is still working for entering the latest outputs. And lots of these numbers that you see are actually coming from my analysis of the data, of the data that is in the database. And we did a, a strategic program assessment when we looked into what uh, what what parts of a project actually performed the best and where we published the most data, and for example, others that we didn't publish anything from, but we collected data. We had a couple of things regarding governance. This was our team structure. Uh, we established authorship guidelines because very early in the process, we realized that people coming from different disciplines have very different papers what qualifies as authorship. So we just made sure that we as a team on the same page regarding that. And in 2021, we established BITS Data Guardianship Panel. Anybody who wanted to publish something or use BITS data for any purposes needed to submit their proposal to the Guardianship Panel to assess, provide feedback, and then either grant access to the data or not. And that's still in place. As I said, we, in 2019, we won the Otago Research Group Award for this work. So a lot of people were here were on the, uh, were with us at that time as well. So congratulations to you. That's a wonderful recognition of this work. And then we, in February 2020, we had a quite a team to get together and we were planning the future. Well, February 2020, everyone knows what happened. <laughs> <laughs> this was the time when the big natural experiment data started, the, the data collection started with the beginning of March 2020. So we needed to learn from the past, cherish the present, embrace the future, whatever that was bringing. So for those of you who know, this is the top of the Rio crossing, and this is a late crater of volcano exploring. That's my explanation of the year 2020. <laughs> In picture, one picture. So a lot of things happened during that year. Uh, the big data collection stopped. Uh, we obviously couldn't go to the schools, but it was postponed for a year. The school were happy to support us, but they said, well, well, we don't know what's going on. Kids are not going to school. We just can't do anything right now. 
Um, I joined the University of Oakland University of Technology as adjunct professor. My family moved to Wellington. I joined the Project Management Institute of New Zealand at that time. The future of it became so uncertain. We didn't even know if they were going to continue. So I spent the time writing the book, connecting people, disciplines, and world just for the instant with many, many, many of our photos and stories from the first seven years. So that was quite a quite a race. Um, quite a quite an adventure. And then we, we adapted the new normal. It was all online. We did whatever we could do in 2020 before we get back and continue data collection a year, basically 15 months later. We had three COVID-related interruptions for data collection before we could actually conclude it in June 2020. A massive thank you to the team who endured all this uncertainty, including being in the meeting and doing data, having Four, having three weeks of data collection lined up, and we were on day two when the minister uh, uh, announced at 7 p.m. It was Janet's professorial lecture, mm -hmm. where some of us were on. I was down from Wellington, and they just announced the lockdown starts at midnight. And my husband called me and said, What are you going to do? I have no idea. I'll see if I can get on a flight tomorrow <laughs> to come back home. So it was it was really a super uncertain time. So thank you to the team. And, Kim, who is sitting in the back, she was the project manager of the Beats, uh, Beats 2 or Beats Natural Experiment, and she handled all these madness of three years of data collection. So thank you. <laughs> Big applause to you. Um, so basically, 2021 was considered a future adopt, respond, and create a new vision to expand the reach and impact. So I will, I will skip this just for the sake of time, but basically, a lot of things have happened. Some of these I've shared in the background. But a lot of things have changed uh, from then on. I was no longer in the meeting. I got different jobs. I But I did continue running the beats for the last three years off-site and for the last two, and basically two and a half years, um, doing it on top of a full-time job because I really wanted to see this finish. Um, this is the research I'm going to show you. Just a couple more slides and I'll be done. This is the research program funding ups and downs. So we usually see the successes. This is what we talk about. We got a $1.5 billion of funding, but there was actually about 60% of funding that we applied for that we never got. And uh, so that's also an interesting story. And this is what I mentioned, value for money. For a million dollars in research funding, we published, 20, we published 27 scientific journal articles, 107 conference ups and 37 technical reports. So that's a 10 times higher research productivity than New Zealand average. So what's next? Well, as I mentioned, I moved on and doing research consultancy work and doing research training with uh, publishing books in a, and doing training on our research, uh, different aspects of research and research project management. We have a new project that's using BEATS data that's been funded by Lockheed Health and it's led by Professor Melody Smith from Auckland. And I work uh, in the transport sector as well as the city council. So my, uh, my current activities, and as I mentioned, these are the research um, Compass Guide research training resources. And I'm very proud to say that my latest book on research project management, in the last week I've been nominated as a finalist for a project management of music, project management institute in New Zealand award for academic achievement in project management. So I'm to do that. If anybody would like to see either, there are two books here, there are inspection copies here, and, I can pass them. I know many of you know it, but if you don't have a lot to browse through. Okay, so I'll finish off with this slide. This is my favorite slide. <laughs> and this is actually, this infographic is based on the actual events and the lead researchers' budget related happiness index along the 10 year beats research journey. So we talk about successes for everything, and we hear about this part. And then we come, somebody, you are now hearing, some of you are hearing about this for the first time, say, wow, this is amazing. There was a lot of tears and pain along the way. And all of the people here have been part of that journey can attest that. But there was also absolutely amazing amount of happiness. So with that, I'm going to thank you and open the floor for questions. I know the answer to this one, but I, it's fascinating. How heavy are school children's school bags? Oh, yeah. <laughs> on average, five and a half kilograms mm -hmm. and nearly 10% of their body weight. Wow. And now that my daughter started high school uh, two weeks ago, 
She was just going to school the day I left to come here. She was going to school having her backpack full park and she had another backpack because she couldn't fit anything else in her backpack. And she had a swimming gear and she had a gear for pee. And, and she was holding that one in her hand. So oh, I'll put you okay, mommy. <laughs> And I got a locker at school, he would need to get to the school, to the bus and to the school and carry that road away. It's fascinating. And and it's literally, they don't have a box. It's a lot that needs to be carried back and forth. And they have a, every subject has their own notebook or whatever. Um, so when she brought the stationery, so she was in primary school all the time, she we just bought the stationery for her in um, January. She, this is three times more than I ever needed in primary school for a year. So fascinating. Yeah. Any other questions? If anybody would like, uh, I guess I know all of you here, but you just have a Anything else? Yes, Mommy. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's like I have heard it a lot. Yeah, but. <laughs> but it's just like more a, a reflection since you are like out of it right now. If you are looking back, and I remember the first question I asked you when we met in Copenhagen before I started everything, I was like, it's always the work life balance. And you're just like laughing at me when I asked that. And I, I just like asking for you right now, shoot in an imaginary condition if you want to. Still have the work life balance doing this amazing achievement. What would you want to add to the process? To the mm -hmm. right. yeah. I, that's a great question. And I had I have seen a fantastic, fantastic uh, post on LinkedIn about work life balance. And it was like this. It was saying work life balance, so here's work life. Or you can have a work life balance like this. Here's a work, here's life. Or maybe you have a work-life balance that's like this. There is work here, there is life here, there is work here, there is life, there is life, there is work. Or you may have a work-life balance that is all mesh. <laughs> and they were saying, which one is your work-life balance? I think it really depends how you define a work-life balance. So for me, what you've seen with these, that was very more. I got so much out of it personally. It was by far the most rewarding, the most challenging, the most um, the most inspiring piece of work I've ever been involved in. And it generated for me personally, I travel the world. I have friends and colleagues from around the globe now that I would have never gotten if I treated my job like this, right? And it's, um, uh, not just job. It, I guess there is a borderline because you can easily make it like that. But it's just a question of whether something is work. And a lot of that for me was just a pure joy. Like deciding yesterday that for this presentation, I'm going to change all the slides to my company background. And then I was literally fixing the slides in the presentation. I took a taxi here because I was so late. And then came here and saw I was here. I said, oh my gosh, I still need to fix it. I'm glad it worked out at all. But you, it worked out. Talk about, talk about project management. The worst project management task I've ever done. Like I'm a beginner. I've never presented this before. Um, but it really depends. It's a great question. And it really depends how you organize your life. For me, it's been all this fluid. And it's been like this. And what academia allows, like, for example, it's not even been like that. It's been like this. If I need to take a time for work, I do it. If I need to take a time for life, I do it. If I need to take a time for life here again, work here, life here. And maybe that's one week, and maybe another week is going to be this is work, this is work, and this is life, and this is life. So everybody chooses their own box. Would I do anything different? I would call you again to all all this. I've got so much out of it that I could have never even imagined. And I think the friendships, the memories, the lifetime memories, and the fact that I can come back to this city and, you know, there is literally here in the audience, seven of us out of that whole picture and the beats ending, right? And I didn't have to be here. And I didn't have to do here and not, none of you had to come here. It's something that's much stronger than just work. I never treated this as just as work. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a that's a that's a blessing and a curse at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Jen. Well, it's 
as somebody who's been a little bit part of the student from the start, it's just been utterly inspiring to see it emerge and grow and then take on a new life and new needs and new people and produce the most incredible array of, of outputs, not just academic ones, mm. but ones that have direct policy relevance. Um, just to say, congratulations, it's been an amazing ride. And, and you've been right in the middle there, all the way in that happen. So all of that work, life pushing, has had brilliant outcomes. It's really satisfying. <laughs> well done. Thank you, thank you. And it's really the team, you know, there, as you all know, who are here and part of the story, it's been, it's been some very, very rough times, and it's actually been the team carried me through it, you know, not me carrying the team. So, you know, it's really the teamwork, and it's that whole, you know, how this session was entitled, it's the power of vision, the teamwork, and the project management. I would add a few more things, power of perseverance, power of <laughs> quite a few other things could be there, but the title was a little bit too long. <laughs> well, just a, a follow on from Janet. If it hadn't been Sandy, we wouldn't have said yes to the project. Mm -hmm. And you already worked for schools on some sports stuff. And we knew that she would be reliable and she'd do what she said she would do, and she would do it 110% all the time. So these wouldn't have occurred if it hadn't been Sandy. That's yeah. absolutely sure. Yeah. yeah, but it also wouldn't have occurred if it wasn't for schools who stepped in and supported. True. We all but know. We both got a win, but yeah. on but the academic fact. side, you have to be there for the win yeah. to come from academic. Yeah. And, yeah. and could I just add that, by how kind of late in the process, but that continued uh, in the last four or five years as well. We mm -hmm. there and and here. Uh, and that's what schools are speaking of. We were prepared to um, contribute and work to. It. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and I, I just want to say that I think the full impact isn't clear yet and won't be clear for a number of years when all of the findings end up as policy for planners. Mm -hmm. And then we can do another review and say, my gosh, look at them, look at what happened mm -hmm. as a result of this. Well, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't share, like, for example, that this work is feeding through so many of different things that I do professionally now, not just work, like the experience, right? Mm -hmm. Including what I do about the city council. You know, that was not a part of this conversation, but it's actually just feeding with all that. There was just so many learnings through the whole process about research, about teamwork, about project management, about academia, about it. Life in general, <laughs> about different cultures and student facilities. Great. I'm a very near two o'clock. Some of you need to go and need to take another picture before we leave. <laughs> Are you going? I just thought you might Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate it. Um, you, you have an idea, so far? I've got it. Oh, you got it.